Coming up next, though, we have Chris, and um, he's going to talk about how open hardware needs open standards, because it's one thing to have a design, it's another thing for other people to be able to trust it. Um, so thank you, Chris. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, and thanks to all the hosts for uh, setting up the uh, Open Hardware Summit. I'm going to be sharing my screen. All right, can y'all see that? Okay. Uh, great, well, thanks for uh, listening. And uh, again, to all the organizers, uh, I'm really glad to be talking for the first time uh, at the Open Hardware Summit um, about uh, everyone's favorite topic, standards. I know they're very exciting. Um, you know, standards have a reputation for being kind of boring, but um, I feel like they're uh, an important part of what we do as hardware designers. Um, so open hardware needs open standards. I'm going to explain what open standards are and why we need them. Uh, and uh, I'm using the Lisa Simpson meme here to be upfront about the fact that this is uh, going to come off a bit as, as an angry rant uh, where I complain about the present situation without necessarily offering a specific solution yet. Uh, but I'm really just scratching at the surface of this problem and hoping to open up the conversation within the community to see uh, how we can start taking steps together toward a solution. Uh, I'm going to be talking uh, mostly about safety standards today. Uh, there's a lot of other topics that standards apply to, um, and I'll, I'll touch on those at some point. But most I'm concerned with um, safety, and in particular, electrical safety. Um, I also need to mention that some of my references will be uh, a little bit biased by my experience by standards uh, in the United States, where I'm based. But uh, most of the concepts should apply pretty generally, internationally. Uh, turns out that most American standards are adapted from international standards bodies. And um, I believe the same is true in a lot of other countries. Uh, so a brief background on me. Uh, I've been involved uh, with a lot of different things over the years, um, from astrophysics research, uh, interactive art installations, um, Linux uh, audio software. Uh, I've released uh, an open hardware product, which is a computer music interface board. Uh, I've worked with neuroscientists to develop open source data acquisition systems. And uh, lately, I've been working on um, technology related to environmental sustainability, in particular uh, solar energy systems, and IoT for sustainable farming and things like that. Uh, and so I've kind of been all across the map. But uh, one thing that's tied it all together for me has been open source. Uh, really believe that open source hardware and software is a huge part of what's allowed me to bounce between these uh, disparate disciplines like that, because it's lowered the barrier to entry and encourages collaboration and reuse of tools. Uh, so I feel like I owe a lot to open source. I'm always trying to give back when I can. Um, one, of, one of the ways I've been doing that recently is through uh, this engineering cooperative that we launched last year. Uh, it's called Interstitial Technology. And uh, it's, it's many things, actually. But one of the roles we fill is as an open source consultancy, uh, guiding projects to, uh, th through open source principles. And that goes for software as well as hardware. Uh, we're also a worker cooperative. So the consultants own the firm and manage it democratically, kind of a social experiment. Uh, and finally, we're a public benefit corporation in the state of Colorado, which means that we uh, have explicitly stated public benefit purposes, uh, which uh, include applying open source technology toward environmental sustainability, human rights efforts, uh, community outreach, and other things too. So it's a cool project. And uh, if you'd like to learn more, you can visit our website here. Maybe you want to work with us and get in touch. Uh, okay. Great. So uh, story time. Uh, I was working on an open hardware project recently uh, called Automato. It's one of these uh, kind of IoT for farming or DIY agriculture projects. and. Um, we were developing a uh, open hardware print circuit board, which is basically a smart power strip. So something you could plug your appliances into, uh, your lights and your fans and stuff, and control over a network uh, using an open source tech stack. Uh, so a simple concept. We figured we'd put some relays on a board and a shift register. And uh, oh, wait a minute. This thing needs to handle AC mains power, uh, which is 170 volt peak here in the United States. So there's this risk of electric shock. 
Um, so suddenly it's not so simple. We need to be thinking about um, uh, electrical parameters, the trace width on the board, uh, the clearance between conductors, creepage, which is kind of like clearance, um, and uh, proper grounding, earth grounding. Uh, so it was the first time I've dealt with a board like that. And we wanted to make sure that we were doing it right. Uh, we were aware of these, uh, these these certifications and safety standards, like uh, like UL in the in the U.S. Um, uh, Underwriters Laboratory, and uh, thought, well, we know we'll, we know we'll probably need to get that certification eventually. Uh, but in the meantime, can we just read the standard to see to see what the right thing is? I mean, we're going to go through a couple of prototypes of this project anyway before we get to a final product. Uh, well, it turns out to just to acquire that standard costs thousands of dollars uh, just to download this PDF which has this basic safety information. I mean, it's not basic. There's a lot of science behind it. Um, but in the end, it's, it's, it's a couple of numbers, and I'll show you those in the next slide. Um, and so this game is a bit of a shock. And uh, there are other standards that kind of relate to this domain of uh, printed circuit board parameters for safety, uh, notably IPC 2221. The, uh, the kind of de facto for, for kind of generic computer equipment safety is this I. IEC 60950-1, which is an international standard adopted by Underwriters Laboratory in the US and then CSA in Canada. And so that, that's the one we were kind of dealing with mostly. Um, and so we're, yeah, we were kind of up against this paywall. And not only that, if we were to, um, if we were to, to, to fork over the cash for the, for the documents, we'd be bound by a non-disclosure agreement, which has interesting implications for, uh, for open source technology since we're sharing our designs. Uh, so, so just so you have an idea, I mean, this is this is kind of the uh, this is the contraband here, which I'm, which I'm not actually allowed to show you because this is copyrighted data. Um, it's basically uh, some graphs and tables, including uh, you know how many millimeters your traces need to be to carry a certain amount of current, and uh, how far they need to be spaced apart, assuming a certain conductor and operating temperature and stuff like that. Um, so it's basic stuff, but it's important stuff. And uh, it's it's guarded by uh, these private institutions, uh, many of which operate uh, for profit um, and uh, don't really share their results uh, between each other. Um, so uh, yeah, what's a what's a simple hardware hacker to do in this situation? You can you can purchase the documentation, uh, which could be prohibitively expensive, uh, depending on your situation, and uh, even if you do. Yeah, you're bound by these these NDAs, uh, which might prevent you from actually releasing parts of your design, especially if your design includes any kind of uh, testing or uh, flexible constraints like design rules checks, which reflect the standards, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, but either way, it's not it's not an ideal solution for um, for open hardware. And none of these are really. I mean, your other options are to to uh, to trust the third party. So I'm I'm sure I can uh, imagine a few of you listening are saying, "Come on, these numbers must be available somewhere. Uh, somebody must have leaked them. They must be in a blog post or something somewhere." And uh, and yeah, that's true. Um, there they are available online in, in various kind of reduced forums. Um, there there are even some kind of calculator uh, widgets uh, online that'll help you calculate trace widths. Um, but you know, there's, um, there's issues with that. I mean, you need to trust that they're uh, that they're correct, and that they're up to date, uh, and that they'll be around next year. Um, I mean, these, these third party hosts uh, have nothing to do with the standards bodies which develop them. Um, so obviously, the standards bodies uh, being kind of a persistent entity is, uh, is advantageous in its own way. But I'll, I'll touch upon that later. Um, and the third option is, is, to, is to pirate the documents. Uh, I mean, these are just PDFs after all, a couple hundred pages. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to you to guess which option we ended up going with. So uh, there's got to be a better way. Um, it's easy to see how the situation stands counter to the spirit of open hardware. I mean, we're using uh, open source uh, electronics design software, KiCad mostly, open source libraries, open source firmware. And the final design of the product will be open source. Uh, but the conductor spacing that's recommended to prevent an electrical fire uh, is a trade secret. Uh, so, I mean, we, we can do better than this, right? Uh, yeah, I think we can. Uh, the solution is open standards. And one only needs to look toward the software world to see 
some great examples. Um, I mean, the the most salient ones I think are are, are the internet standards and the web standards, um, like well, the internet protocol IP, TCP, UDP, HTTP. These these basic protocols of the internet have been so fundamental, um, th and th from from the get go, actually, they were they were open standards. They, you might be familiar with these uh, with the RFCs, the requests for comments by the uh, uh, Internet Engineering Task Force uh, and um, IRTF and 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 these organizations. Um, you can go to this this URL to see them, and it's kind of amazing. I mean, these things kind of just started as text documents emailing around um, the community and ended up becoming becoming the standards which, which on which the internet uh, depends uh, web standards kind of fall into, into into the same category html css javascript a lot of these are maintained by the World Wide web consortium and uh, ecma for javascript and um i mean I don't, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that the internet would not have developed as rapidly or successfully as it did had these uh, crucial standards been like proprietary trades, trade secrets or something. Um, in a similar vein, there's, I mean, there's cryptographic protocols, AES and RSA, which, um, you know, need to be uh, implemented according to some specification in order to be considered secure. And uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, maintains a couple standards for, for those. Um, and, uh, and then there's uh, document formats, quite a few actually. Uh, ODF comes to mind, the uh, open document format, which is maintained by Oasis. So, um, I mean, so much of the software that that kind of the open web depends on, I would say, uh, depends on open standards. And uh, so there's strong precedent for this kind of thought, I think, in, in our work. Uh, you might be asking, what makes a standard open? Uh, well, it actually depends on who you ask. Uh, in fact, if you go to the Wikipedia page for open, standard there's no less than 22 i think definitions uh from different organizations but basically uh they all kind of share these common these common traits the standards themselves should be open access and preferably uh, gratis meaning uh zero dollars um they should be uh, free to implement so you, should, you shouldn't be violating any intellectual property by implementing the standards they should be free to share you shouldn't be bound by any non-disclosure agreements uh they need to have no dependencies like dependencies on external patents or other closed standards. So they need to be uh, transparent through and through. Um, and, 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 bonus, and for bonus points, and I think, I, think this is a, I think this is an important point, is that, I mean, the best open standards have been developed in the open. So they're, they've been subject to open participation by the community and interested parties, usually some consortium of, of, of companies or, or organizations that have uh, participated in an open consensus model to um, uh, to arrive at the standard that works for all of them. And that process is, is to be transparent. Request for comments, RFC is a perfect example of that. Um, it's worth thinking about uh, classifying standards into different types because we need to treat them a little bit differently. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna mention some of these for consideration. I mean, first of all, there, there's technical standards versus procedural standards. Oh, but what I mean by procedural is that a lot, a lot of standards have to do with how an organization operates. Uh, especially if it has to do with uh, information security or quality control, uh, how many people you have at different stages of the pipeline checking for errors, things like that, uh, versus technical standards, which would be, um, you know, numerical quantitative standards for the technical specifications of a product. Um, the, the, the scope varies as well, and that's important. I've been talking about uh, electrical safety here. Um, I mean, we could also talk about thermal safety, fire, uh, mechanical uh, failure modes, radiation, uh, chemical safety. These are, I mean, standards for all these could be important potentially for open hardware projects. Um, interoperability and uh, compatibility is, is, I think, a huge category of standards. And that's one which has kind of been developed. Chris, I'm giving you 30 seconds. All right. Stay on time. Thank you. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different types of standards, and we're, and we're going to treat them differently according to how, uh, what, they, what they pertain to. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this um, today, but um, I just want to say that you know we still need we still need testing. So open standards are not going to solve all of our problems. Um, we're going to need uh, certification for final products. But I just want to point out that a lot of this testing can be can be implemented at the design phase, and this is the approach that the software community has taken through continuous integration. You can test the implementation of a standard while you're developing it. 
Uh, so so my, my next steps from here are basically to uh, to try and develop something like this for uh, for open hardware uh, for, according to the electrical specification. And I'd be thrilled to talk with others who are interested in this problem to uh, to collaborate on on efforts like this. Um, thanks so much. Thanks for listening, and please feel free to contact me. Thank you, Chris.